We all remember from EMT school that shock is hypoperfusion. Today, we're going to talk about traumatic shock due to bleeding. Remember, always stop serious bleeding first. When I was in school, it was ABC. Thankfully, they have come to their senses and realizing that prioritizing the airway in a patient who is exsanguinating is stupid because it's not helpful to arrive to the side of a patient who is actively dying and spurting bright red blood through their thigh and inserting an oral airway. Body gets injured, tissues get disrupted, vessels get torn open, bleeding happens. Bleeding initiates the clotting cascade. However, when it's significant bleeding, the body's clotting mechanisms aren't able to keep up. And while what it's doing is helpful and well-intentioned, it's like trying to use Billy May's flax seal on the levee in New Orleans during Katrina. And of course, if the patient is on blood thinners, that's going to be a big problem for reasons that I don't think I need to explain. The body responds systemically to try and compensate for the blood loss. The first thing that it does is increase the cardiac output to pump more blood to the body. So you will see the patient's heart rate elevate. You'll also see their respiratory rate elevate. And the body vasoconstricts the periphery, the skin, and other parts of the body that aren't vital organs because it wants to preserve blood flow for the vital stuff. The clamped vessels in the periphery and skin reduces blood flow, and that is why you will see the shock patient become pale. The vasoconstriction and elevation in cardiac output actually does a really good job to maintain the blood pressure. And this is called compensated shock, which is simply when the shock patient has an initially good blood pressure. How do you know which patient is in compensated shock? Well, obviously, you can use your brain and do that whole patient assessment and intuition thing. I like to use the shock index. Shock index is the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure. If it's greater than 0.9, that indicates a higher level of shock. Always use the shock index when assessing your trauma patients. You don't want to be the buffoon who signs off a patient who is tachycardic after a car accident. You tack up their heart rate due to anxiety, but they were actually in a compensated shock state. Don't be a dumbass. Do be aware that the shock index is not reliable in patients who take beta blockers because they can't increase their heart rate for compensation. And the shock index can't be used in children because they have higher heart rates at baseline. Without stopping the bleeding and good resuscitation, the shock patient will crash. They can't compensate forever. Once their catecholamines deplete, they're not going to compensate anymore and kaboom, they crash. This is decompensated shock, which is simply identified by the shock patient with hypotension. Aside from stopping the bleeding, what can you do for shock? First, let's talk about what you don't want to do, and that is dump a bunch of isotonic crystalloid in the patient to raise the blood pressure. That will dilute clotting factors, put pressure on, and wash away microclots that are forming. And at best, it won't help acidosis, but it'll probably worsen it. These patients need blood. Whole blood is best, but if that's not available, they need a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of blood products at a time. Do not shoot for a normal blood pressure. A little better is fine. If you are one of those robots who needs parameters, 90 systolic is fine and 110 systolic if they have a multi-system trauma that involves the brain. Bar none, probably the most important pre-hospital intervention that you can do for these patients aside from stopping bleeding is to keep them warm. Not warm, hot. These patients are bleeding, they're coagulopathic, their vasculature's clamped down, they're going to be cold as shit and hypothermic. When they are hypothermic, they get even more acidotic. When they are hypothermic and acidotic, they get more coagulopathic, which means more bleeding, and then more hypothermia and more acidosis, and so on and so on. Wrap them up in a cocoon, pile blankets on top, and turn the heat on blast. The importance of this cannot be understated. What about TXA? TXA stabilizes the clot matrix and prevents existing clots from being broken down. EMS loves to talk about TXA and acts like it's the end-all be-all of trauma care. Like if you're on an ambulance, you can give TXA, then you're a trauma superhero in these people's eyes. Well, the reality is that TXA is kind of like, meh. I mean, it's not going to hurt them. CRASH-2 was a huge study that showed big-time good data in outcomes in bleeding patients when they were administered TXA in a timely fashion. After CRASH-2, TXA had this Taylor Swift moment where it's all you fucking heard about. You pretty much couldn't even log on to Pornhub without seeing something about TXA improving outcomes in hemorrhagic shock. Well, in the now almost 14 years since CRASH-2 was published, they have studied TXA again and again and again, and the data is kind of like... Meh. The most recent and arguably most notable applicable study, Patch Trauma, was published this year and showed that at six months there was really no difference in functional outcomes between TXA and placebo. The lesson is that TXA is not going to hurt the patient if you give it to them. It may help some patients, but 
it's probably not a big deal if the patient doesn't get TXA and you are not the goat of trauma if you are giving TXA pre-hospital. To summarize, one, stop the bleed. Two, keep the patient hot. Three, compensated shock is differentiated from decompensated shock by blood pressure. Four, don't give isotonic crystalloids. They need blood products. Target blood pressure is 90. Five, TXA is like sriracha sauce in my opinion. Nothing wrong with it per se, sometimes good, but it's definitely not all it's cracked up to be. Stay tuned because I will be putting out an advanced shock concepts video sometime in the future.